recording a podcast with Jose, who is a PhD student at the university uh, at the ETH in Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, we talked about all kinds of things, his super cool research uh, with uh, optical materials um at high temperatures like synthesizing them he's a phd student there so that's what his phd is all about uh quite a lot to do with thermodynamics uh with optics and uh, uh scanning electron microscopy and focused ion beam uh, sections and all of that he also recently published a cool paper together with his team so we also spoke a little bit about that and uh, yeah, his journey from Barcelona to uh, Catalonia to uh, where he is now in Switzerland, in Zurich. So yeah, we talked about a lot of things and what his wishes are and what the followers can expect. So yeah, quite a fun uh, episode and can't wait to share it with you all. Hi everyone, my name is Pranoti and I am your host of the Under the Microscope podcast, video podcast. Um, and today we have with us Jose Okana Pujol, who is a PhD student at ETH Zurich, uh, which is in Switzerland. ETH, ETH Zurich, um, basically one of the most uh, reputed uh universities or institutions around the world so hi jose welcome to under the microscope how are, hi, you? Um, how are you doing today well i'm actually a bit sick so not in the best state for this recording but uh, other than that uh, everything is good what happened you sound a bit what happened yeah uh, basically uh I I swam into the beautiful Zurich Lake uh, recently because we had very good weather, but the cold was uh, the water was very cold and somehow thermodynamics uh, didn't uh, take uh, a lot of care of me and my body didn't like the temperature shock. I think. So is it is it safe to say that the thermodynamics didn't give a shit about you? That's fairly good to say. Yes. <laughs> But I, I guess you could also say that I didn't give a shit about thermodynamics because I should have known that before jumping into the water. True, true, <laughs> so, true. Yeah. And thermodynamics won, so... Yeah, and thermodynamics, it always wins. So. Um, okay, that, uh, I hope you feel better soon and I hope you have learned your lesson in thermodynamics. Uh, wow, there are so many jokes I can do about this. Uh, but <laughs> let's get started with... Uh, getting to know you and your science. Yes. Um, so please explain your research to us in super simple words, please. As you, I'm 12 years old, and yeah, all I know is thermodynamics gave you a cold. Tell me. Yeah. So I'm I'm doing a PhD here, um, broadly in optical metamaterials. Mm -hmm. Metamaterials are just some materials that instead of so they base their uh, properties instead of in the chemistry. So typically when we describe a material, and I'm in the material science department, so I should know that, you say like, okay, so this is uh, very tough because it's a steel. This is transparent because it, it's glass. So it goes back to what kind of atoms, what kind of chemistry do we have there? Mm -hmm. In metamaterials, it's not like this. In metamaterials, the properties are defined by the geometry that these materials have in a very sp specific way. Yes, so we... So the idea is a bit that by the geometry, by what kind of shapes and patterns you have on them, right. you can have you can change the properties of the material to a point where the properties are abnormal, are not what one typically finds in nature. Really? So when you say geometry, do you mean the crystal structure? It can be the crystal structure, but it can also be bigger things. So I I have this example over here just by chance. Um, oh, wow. See, the, so just a disclaimer, this is not mine. This was a present that my, we'll get there, but my uh, office colleague during my master's thesis gave to me. He was working on mechanical metamaterials. I'm working in optical metamaterials. Right. But I think it symbolizes pretty well what happens. You know, like typically when you press a material in one direction, right. it will expand in the other direction. Correct. Right? Correct. Here you have a kind of material that when you press it in one direction, Right. It also compresses in the other direction. Right. Oh, that's what you mean by geometry. 
Oh exactly. My and this is just because of how specifically these holes are made. I could not reproduce this. This is not my field. But basically, I do the same with optical properties. So oh my we God, like to design cool. materials that, I mean, the, the simplest example with uh, optical properties is, you know that typically when you put something like a straw or a pencil in a glass of water, yeah. it looks like the pencil is broken. Bent. And yeah. yeah, right. This is because of refraction and so on. This is right. because of the refractive index. Well, right. there are examples in optical metamaterials, and actually, I think to some extent that's how the field got started. Sorry, uh, science historians, um, <laughs> where you can have negative refraction. And if anyone hears Google's negative refraction water, you will find like this picture of the pen going into a glass. And then it coming in the in the opposite direction, or it looking like it comes in the opposite direction, and that's how it will look if it has negative refraction. So that's the idea, and this is just because of how we design the materials. We make things very very small, smaller than the wavelength in the case of uh, the optics, or smaller than the deformation in the case of mechanics. Right. And right. this changes the properties of the materials. Oh wow, that that's is a cool. material. Well, uh, plainly put. Oh my god, that is so cool. That is so cool, and for. Everyone listening to the podcast and not watching the video, please head over to the Science Talk YouTube channel and find this episode because Jose just showed us some science magic uh, with the with this uh, mechanic mecha, mechanic meta mechanical metamaterial yes. mechanical metamaterial uh, gift that he received uh, from someone and oh my god that's so cool oh from Giorgio that's uh, mentioned him I haven't seen him you know what sorry what's his name again Giorgio Giorgio yeah alrighty where is uh, Giorgio now to be honest I have no clue uh, probably in the Netherlands that's where <laughs> <laughs> but we can't see the European that. continent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. That sounds. Oh my God. That sounds so cool. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. So you basically, uh, okay, you work on materials to make sure that they are functioning well uh, at like high temperatures, like 1,500 well, degrees Celsius yes. uh, or so, and you do that by changing the geometry or well there are like two things there right like so yes the basic the basic idea of metamaterials is let's take a lot of care of the geometry let's design materials with a very specific geometry right so that they can have the properties that we are looking for instead of changing the material and going to a different chemistry we're just changing the geometry that's the basic idea right um in my subgroup i'd say so my supervisor specifically focuses on uh, what we could call scalable metamaterials. So, because, okay, here in the case of these mechanical metamaterials, these holes are pretty big. But right. another another foundational thing of metamaterials, basically, is that this geometry that we engineer needs to be smaller than the actuation that we have. Which means that in the case of light, light waves can be classified by the wavelength. So, what's the distance between the different peaks? Right. Invisible light, we are talking, you know, about 500 to 800 nanometers, more or less. Yeah. Okay. If, if you want to have a meta material that works with visible light, right. you need your feature size, your geometry, to be at least, let's say, five times smaller than the wavelengths. So yeah. then we are talking about nanoscience, right? Um, what this led to is that the first meta materials that were designed, they were designed with this top-down approach, which meant that they were very difficult to fabricate, mm -hmm. um, very time consuming and so on. And basically my supervisor and also the other PhD students, we broadly focus on designing metamaterials that can be fabricated in minutes, not in days, um, in a scalable, uh, in a scalable manner. Right. That's the first thing. Right. And then specifically, I, I do that with something called the uh, magnetron spattering, which is a technique that allows you to stack materials, mm -hmm. and I like I ended up looking at how these metamaterials can be used in applications in which thermal stability is required. So mm -hmm. there are. Why do I mean by that? Applications in which you are at high temperatures, meaning from hundreds to thousands of degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of proposed applications that require to work on that. So one of them is hyperthermia. This is more for the bio people, but it's this idea that you can have 
something, put it in your body, direct it directly to the part that you need to eliminate, and then activate it, it will hit that palot and kill those cells. Right. Of course, this thing that you put in your body needs to be able to withstand those temperatures. Otherwise, it will not get so hot, right? That's one example. The other uh, example, and that's something that I'm working more closely on, is thermophotovoltaics, for instance. Right. This is the idea that instead of using the light directly coming from the sun to generate electricity, we can use the light that comes from objects that are very hot to generate electricity. So there is this thing called the black body radiation. This is what dictates in physics that, you know, when you hit something up, first it goes orange, then it goes white and so on. It's recycling this heat that can come also from the sun or can come from recycling industrial applications or whatever to generate electricity. Right. And these materials that you're going to use there need to be able to withstand temperatures between 1000 and 2000 degrees. Okay. And there it would be very useful if we could use some metamaterials because they interact with light in awesome ways, but you need to be able to design something that will withstand these temperatures. Right, so and also function well. Right. Exactly. Because right. things tend to degrade at very high temperatures. Right, so that's your PhD work, basically yes. finding materials uh, or create, synthesizing materials or ways for scalable production of these materials, which will be uh, functioning and doing the job at high temperatures, 1000 to 2000, depending on the application. That's that's a good summary, yes. Ah, okay, that sounds really cool. So, uh, Jose, how did you end up working on this cool project in in switzerland uh, tell us about your science journey so far by chance actually oh. so <laughs> by chance and luck um okay. so my science journey i guess started um, back home um i, I was born, where uh, i'm a spanish citizen, citizen. Uh, okay. i'm from catalonia and bon dia <laughs> bona tarda <laughs> muchas gracias bona tarda Bonanit. I only know. Oh wow, but that's uh, that's pretty impressive, already. Right? Yeah, oh, my my very good friend is from Catalonia, so oh, nice. uh, yeah. Bon dia, Bonanit, Bon. Sorry, never mind. Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was impressive. I typically don't meet uh, international people who know uh, some words in Catalan, so thanks for that. Um, yeah, so basically, I started there. I did my bachelor there um, in nanoscience. That was the name of the bachelor. Mm -hmm. I was. I'm very excited about it because I think I was the second promotion that uh, studied a degree in nanoscience back in Spain. And it was the only place in Spain where you could study it, uh, the Autonomous University of Barcelona, where it was. So it meant that, you know, we had people from all over Spain. There was this new degree. It was kind of cool. Uh, however, I became a bit um, deceived by the end of it uh, with the whole idea. And uh, I decided that I did not like the fact, quite ironically, I decided that I did not like the fact that my degree was so research oriented. Mm -hmm. It's something that you could say, yeah, what did you expect? I'm studying something so new, <laughs> but. Yeah. And, and then I decided to go to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam, to do a master that would take me out of research, basically. So it was a master. It was a master in physics, but it was called physics, uh, science for energy and sustainability, and it had like these thirty credits in which you could take environmental chemistry management courses. Like the idea was like to look at the broad idea of uh, behind like energy and sustainability. Right. Okay. And as a master, it was very fun. Um, I met great people. I learned a lot. I actually uh, managed uh, to get a student job once a week uh, doing that, doing uh, energy analysis. But uh, in order to get your master in physics, you actually need to do a master thesis in physics, a one, <laughs> a one year thesis. So then there was this year in which I was doing these two things. I was working part time. Um, and at the same time, I was researching uh, in Atamov. Uh, by the way, I think you already had people being interviewed from there. I, from Amos. Yeah, you had a site in your... Uh, we have two people from there. We have Marjorie and we have Syed. Yeah, I don't know Marjorie. Uh, I, I guess that he or she joined a bit later than I left. But uh, Syed was already there. And oh. actually, I came to know the Twitter account, uh, Real Scientist Nano, because a long time ago, I don't remember exactly when, uh, a girl called Loretta... Uh, yes took it over uh, and I knew her from Apple uh, back then. So anyhow, I was lucky enough to end up on this institute, which was a great place to do research. All right. And I ended up 
liking it so much while at the same time I didn't like my job so much. Uh, the, the thing that was paying me, that, that's how I decided to go back into research. Um, uh-huh. And then what happened? Well, yeah, then there was a very uh, coincidental set of steps right. uh, which ended up with me getting an email. So I applied for a position here at ETH. Mm-hmm. Think that I did not get it because indeed it's a prestigious university. Right. And just by some kind of cosmic chance, my master supervisor visited my current group without knowing uh, anything about that. And my current supervisor was like, Oh, you are Esther. Uh, yeah, I have you here in the reference list uh, for this uh, Jose Ocaña. Do you know him? And then from what I understood, she somehow realized that she hadn't responded to the email. And yeah, that uh, gave me a kick start in the application, I guess. And then they invited me to come over and uh, they ended up selecting me. That is so cool. That's yeah, a- yeah, so it was really a coincidence. I'm, I'm very grateful. That, wow, that's that's quite a journey you've had. And wow, what an unconventional sort of a... Yeah, to make it even worse, like I, I, I only found out about this in a karaoke because I was still like hanging out with the PhDs at the place uh, where, at, at Amov. And they told me, yeah, I was like, oh, I'm so happy. I have an interview in Zurich. And they were like, yeah, of course, you're going to get it. Like Esther Werther. I was like, what? <laughs> what are you telling me? <laughs> I don't get it. So, yeah, it was a bit of an exotic combination. Yeah, that's great. That is that is really, really cool. Awesome. So there are there are quite a lot of things you have done. You have been in quite a lot of labs. Um, and my next question might be a bit difficult, uh, but oh. I'm still going to ask it. Uh, do you have uh, a research project out of all the different kinds of experiments and research uh, research work that you have done so far? Do you have one research experiment that you're super proud of? And uh, if you do, I hope you do. Uh, could you explain it to us in simple words in the section we call in other words? Yes. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to choose the latest publication that got published uh, because that's the thing you are the most proud, right? It's, I'm still in the rush. I mean, it got published, it, it got accepted a while ago, but it got published three days ago from the moment we're recording this podcast. So oh. I'm allowed uh, I'm allowed to choose it, I guess. Uh, Congratulations. Yes, of course you're allowed to choose. Just because of that. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, that's the idea. There, um, It's closely related to what we were talking about. Right. In this case, we were uh, examining uh, silver silicon um, silver, multi-layer. Silicon. So you have silver and silicon stacked all over each other mm-hmm. with sizes varying from 15 to 28 nanometers, if I recall correctly. And How much do you have? So we have five by layer. So we actually also played with that at some point uh, in the paper. But uh, we have five and three by layers, so 10 and six layers in total with a uh, Repetition unit varying from 30 to 40 nanometers. So yes. Okay. All righty. So very truly, thick. Truly for nano. nano <laughs> for nano scale, very thick. Well, overall it's very thick, right? But then we had silver layers of indeed of 12 uh, nanometers. They did not get to the paper, but we also synthesized four four nanometers uh, thick uh, silver uh, layers using this. Okay. And yeah, we designed them as a metamaterial, um, as a metamaterial to be a super absorber the near near perfect absorption meaning that it less than one percent of the light uh that goes in gets reflected or transmitted we we descend them for that and well first of all optically you know like as we're saying in my lab we try to do things that are scalable all right uh, these multi-layers i will spattering them in about one hour while typically these metamaterials take days to be uh, fabricated However, there's a problem coming with this, and it's that the interface between the two layers is not going to be super smooth if you do it so quickly. But actually, we found out it's something that we had already been interested in uh, research in literature, but we confirmed that actually this disorder that happens of it not being super smooth, it's actually beneficial for the application. So it actually improves the absorptivity of the whole thing. Um, so disorder is not necessarily bad, okay? <laughs> like... <laughs> That's the first thing, and it's actually good. And then we just decided like, uh, to study how, what was the maximum temperature at which this behavior would be, would be found. And then what we found was actually very surprising, because 
there was a temperature range at which the optical properties were still the same, but if you actually did a FIP cross section, so FIP is a focus ion beam, it means we sent ions like to cut it, and then you actually look at this cut that you did with it's another. It's like cutting a cake, and FIP is exactly, like the knife. It's exactly that. You cut a cake, <laughs> and if you look at the layer structure in the cake, it turns out that the lower layers of the cake were completely degraded. So we had five layers at the beginning, right? And now five by layers at the beginning, and now we only have three because the 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 further down uh, four layers were completely intermixed. But one would never say that looking at the optical properties because mm -hmm. once it's the optical properties and they are the same, and we run a lot of tests about that. Right. And that and that is part of the question. First of all, why is the degradation starting down? Because if you look at literature, typically it's assumed to be uh, isotropic. At the top, yeah. At the top or somewhere or quite regular through the right. section, right? That's, right? And secondly, how can it be that the degradation doesn't impact actually the optical properties? Right. Um, and this is uh, what we researched. We tried to find uh, using also simulations. And then that's the thing I'm the proudest about. Uh, we did tomographies. So it means, imagine, we're taking a picture of the SCM scan uh, of we're just taking a picture of the cake. Mm -hmm. We're cutting a bit more, and we're taking another picture, like to see whether this is something that just happened at this depth or if it's actually. And this allowed us uh, to get tomographies that then we could simulate on. So we could do 3D simulations, and this way we found out that this was driven actually by stress. So this was completely being driven by stress and by the change in the thermal expansion coefficient between the materials, which is something that typically gets overlooked in multilayer theory. So in multilayer theory, they always focus um, on surface area minimization, so mm -hmm. on how much of each layer is in contact with the other one. Correct. And we actually compare both contributions, and it's remember that. And actually, what we did like to prove it finally was, OK, this structure started with silver, and then it had sil silicon, silver, silicon, silver, silicon. What happens if we change architecture? Oh, if we had silicon yes. on the bottom, and then we found out that actually you can tailor where the you can easily tailor where the instability starts. So when we change the order, the thing starts degrading on the top. Um, so and we could just find about that because I we cut a lot of pieces of cake and we looked at them, and it was a and it was a structure that at the same time had an interest from the optical perspective because it was a near perfect absorption. So yeah. That's the paper, and I'm pretty proud about it. Oh my god! Oh my god! That is so cool. Where is the paper published? And congratulations! It's on advanced optical materials. Advanced optical materials. Oh, congratulations! Thank I you. hope you will talk about this paper and show us the cake pictures and everything. I will. I will. That's uh, that's part of the plan. Uh, that is so cool. I can understand why you chose this. This one you're allowed to have, like the exactly. Yeah, uh, and it I'm allowed really to cool. talk about it. You know. Uh. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, was it? I hope your research experience has been wonderful so yeah. far and will continue to be wonderful in the future as well. Um, however, if you had three wishes to improve your research experience, what would you ask for? Three wishes. Not promising anything here, but three wishes. <laughs> I, yeah, you know, like I was thinking about that. Um, and I also saw that uh, this analysis that you did where everyone is complaining about funding and equipment. It's not f the pretty much, right? It's not complaining, OK? It's okay, not but it's the wishes, it's yes. Wishes that's, out there. Those, are the top, those are the top wishes. There was um, also the wish about going to Mars. So um, <laughs> let's keep also that in mind. OK, so go on. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, ETH is a great institution. and. I'm kept away from money decisions. So maybe my supervisor decisions would be different, but I have nothing to complain about instruments, not about funding. So that makes it more difficult like uh, to come up with something. So I will come with something more, uh, a bit more original. Um, I wish that there was a bit more of a specialization in science. What do you mean? So what I mean is right now, the Right now, you get promoted to be a professor based on your research, and then suddenly you are a manager and an educator. Mm. And I'm not very sure that is right. Also, 
you see technicians being forced to publish. Um, so it seems it wow. seems to me that we are going to the old career man, someone who you need to be able to read research, but also like to be an experimental, well, an experimental, like to manage the machines yourself. Um, but also you need to be good at outreach, but also you need to be a good educator, but also suddenly you need to be a good manager. And I'm not sure that's the ideal incentive scheme for, and that's not the best way to organize uh, research. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so better like changing or tweaking the research structure the, from the organizational perspective and yeah. the expectations perspective yeah. so that uh, the researchers are not uh, spreading th thin because uh, yeah. they are needed by the master students, the bachelor students, their technicians, by the machines, by the uh, publishers, by the funding agencies, by yeah, the university. Exactly. By <laughs> The fact that you're a good researcher and that you have good results that not, does not mean that you are good at managing people. writing or, for example, at writing articles the way, because there's also like a very specific kind of language that you have to use and so on, at right. dealing with the editorial world, for example. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's just something that maybe I, I would wish that I'm not like that. I also have like multiple interests, but I know a lot of people who are they like one thing about science and the fact that they need to do all the other things takes them away. Oh, and I, I think we want those people with us. That, yeah, yeah. That's, that's actually an interesting one. So, okay. Um, what else? You have two more wishes. You can ask for a coffee machine also. I don't know why I'm giving you ideas. Uh, we, we, we have a great coffee machine. <laughs> we bought it last March. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, no, but I'll, I'll tell you something. When, and this is a bit unrelated. When I moved here to ETH, the thing I missed the most about Amol was their coffee machine. They have a great coffee machine at the entrance of the building where everyone meets to have great coffee. And here at ETH, it feels like everyone is more like in the room, like it's a bit more. And yeah, maybe that would be my second one. Like in general, uh, greater inclusivity in science, I guess. Um, inclusivity, yeah. That's yeah, and I mean, I'm I'm lucky or I'm privileged. I'm a white European guy, but I mean, this first week, uh, this same week, we had the case of a postdoc that could not join us because of these issues, uh, <laughs> like this. And I know many. I also have a master's student coming from Colombia uh, soon who wants to work with us, and he's been having this kind of problems for quite a while. And yeah. Mm, okay, so more inclusivity. Uh, third wish. Do you have a third one? It feels like you are super like taken care of by ETH Zurich. I should I should really like come to you. <laughs> it sounds like a great place. <laughs> I'm I'm the finally very lucky. Uh, very lucky uh, to be here. Yeah, the third wish. Let's say yeah, the some kind of change in the editorial world. Oh wow! What kind of change? Ah, uh, a change in which the articles that are published more closely reflect the work that people have done. I think that we are losing a, lo a lot of time and taxpayer money, if you want, just because we only publish, publish the things that work out. And there are also like, personally, I have a lot of small projects that were there and there, but that we did not publish because it's too small and we are... We, everyone is aiming for this 10 pages article, you know, because that's what is better for your career and so on. And maybe having the possibility to publish smaller, but also bigger things and that they come the same would mean that I could disseminate my knowledge and people will not have to try this uh, on their own. Right. Mm, yeah. The, uh, a journal of failed experiments or something like that. Yeah. This and the fact, you know, the fact that uh, more people could read them. I'm, I'm also, again, very taken care of. So here in at ETH, you're very encouraged to publish open access, but uh, that's not the case everywhere. So yeah, these kind of things. So a critical reflection of the editorial model and uh, <laughs> what it brings. Yeah, that makes sense. I think just beginning of this week or last week, there was a lot of, I don't know if you followed that on Twitter, there was a lot of discussion with uh, Frontiers, um, yeah. because Frontiers is open access. Yeah, um, I, didn't, I didn't follow the conclusion, but I know. I'll tell you after we stop recording. <gasps> yeah. 
Oh my god, it's so controversial. It's gonna be interesting because I actually know people who work at Frontiers. Uh, they are they are based in Lausanne here in Switzerland, and I oh, know. Right, Frontiers is in Switzerland. Yeah, duh, of course, yeah. I, I don't know if they are based there, but at least they have a very big office. At, uh, in, I, I think I think Frontiers is based, like headquarters is in Switzerland. I think I remember this. Uh, but yeah, I'll tell you that uh, after we stop recording. Yes, I want to say anything controversial on record. Um, alrighty. Um, I I think it's my feeling from talking to you for about an yeah. hour now um, that you really like the research part of being a scientist. Um, what else do you like about being a scientist other than using the fancy instruments and drinking the awesome coffee? <laughs> <laughs> coffee is the finally one thing. Um, so this goes a bit against what I said before about inclusivity. No, I guess it doesn't go against. It's just that I wish we had done more. But the finally, one of the things that I like is the variety of very interesting people that I interact with on a daily basis. <laughs> and actually, that was one of the main reasons why I decided to pursue a PhD and not stay in the private world. Like, because I was comparing at the time, maybe it's a bit unfair, but I was comparing at the time the lunch breaks that we had in the company at at the place where I was doing my PhD. And talking with all those people during my master's thesis was so fun during lunch. They had all these ideas. Everyone came from somewhere different. While in the company, it was more like yeah, buying a house, you know, like more of a, maybe a bit more boring stuff, uh, I would say. Um, and I think- Not it, so much the science. Yeah, exactly. But not only science. I mean, we talk about a lot of things also here, like uh, during break, and it's because there's, people with very different brains somehow <laughs> working on it and it's just great uh all the nice people that i met uh, with different backgrounds and so on ah that is so yeah. cool that is so cool okay this has been wonderful so jose before i let you go um yes. what can the followers of the real scientist nano uh twitter account expect in the week that you are tweeting from the account tell yes. us so i will i will try to um well first i will introduce a bit my lab, ETH, Zurich, and so on, explain the why. The coffee machine. The coffee machine. I promise uh, here that there will be a video of a... Uh, actually, now that we de-escalated it, uh, we could even phone things there. Uh, yeah, so coffee machine is going to be there. Uh, then... Oh, my God, I am so happy for you. Sorry, God. <laughs> I'll tell you something. It took us three years of fighting uh, to get it. So it's it's possible. Just keep asking for it. Okay, just just keep like pestering, pestering, and it will happen eventually. The authorities will give in and get you an amazing coffee machine with a foamer. And hopefully, um, hopefully, because scientists work on caffeine. I mean, it should be uh, yeah, scientists, scientists right uh, to have that. Yeah, and then I will also talk about my research as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Just by coincidence, the week that I'm creating, uh, there are two things happening. Um, First of all, I have some practicum duties, so some I'm giving some practica. So I will show also a bit about what we teach, and I will bring like a couple of uh, experiments uh, to show uh, on the Twitter account. And then actually on Friday I have a career day um, coming in, so I need to stretch a bit my um, brain and uh, my mind about how to do it. But yeah. there will also be some talk about that about. Uh, career opportunities during the PhD and what it gives you and so on. Oh, that sounds so cool. Is it like an open door stay at ETH? It's at ETH. Um, it's called campus interview. So basically, uh, I sent in because my supervisor uh, encouraged me to start looking at what I want to do after the PhD. And mm. basically, they are going to match me automatically with eight companies. Um, and I'm going to have a half an hour discussion with each of them. So I'm very curious to know. Uh, I'm very curious to know. What they, because very few of these companies are actually into science. Uh, no, okay, they all do science, but not the kind of science that I do. So I'm very curious to know how these human resources people who don't really know what I'm doing, um, how they are going to interact with me. Um, I'm just very curious this experience that I didn't have, and not one. So it's going to be 
statistically representative because it's going to be eight of them. Um, so yeah, I will talk a bit about the experience. That is uh, that is so cool. That is so cool. Oh my god, I'm looking forward to your time on uh, Real Scientist Nano and the cake pictures. Well, not the cake, but the film yeah. pictures, uh, the 3D images, and the coffee machine with the foamer um, and uh, the practical play, everything, everything. Yes. We want to know everything. So thank you very much, Jose. Looking forward to having you on Real Scientist Nano, and thank you for. Thank you very much, Pranoti, for this interview. It was a lot of fun. It was my pleasure. Thank you for listening. This is Pranati, host of Under the Microscope. To know more about us, visit our website, thesciencetalk.com, and follow us on Twitter at realsci_nano. underscore